Today on the Deerskin Diary, we're going to be talking about these shadowy American frontier experts, these scouts and spies that were attached to the militia companies who operated in the numerous forts and blockhouses that dotted the frontier. We're going to talk about how much money they made, a little bit about what they carried, and some of the missions that they may have undertaken. So stick with us. In the 18th century, the term scout and spy are interchangeable. It's not until the 19th century that the word spy begins to take on an air of espionage and mystique. Now most scouts were simply militiamen who knew the area and its patterns. They were experts in things like tracking, observation, and horseback riding. And they were employed to guard against any of the warring factions along the frontier, be it the British, the French, or warring tribes. A scout may have been selected for their fighting prowess, but typically it was for their ability to report information back to their commanders. One Revolutionary War veteran named James Collins wrote that his colonel requested him saying, quote, James, I have some business for you to do and recollect much depends on your performance. You are acquainted with all the passways and you are light and a good rider. Operation of the forts and the payment of the scouts cost the colonies a lot of money. One Massachusetts colonial earlier in the 18th century calculated that it cost the colony about 1,000 pounds per each enemy killed. One Western scout reported making five shillings per day. Now by comparison, a sergeant in the Virginia militia also made five shillings per day. The strategy behind the employment of the scouts and spies was an imperfect but necessary one. The frontier was so large there were simply too many holes for any one large body to cover. They used blockhouses and forts, like this one here in the Powell Valley, as a base of operation for the militias and scouts. Joseph Doddridge, who wrote about the settlements in Indian Wars in the western parts of Virginia and Pennsylvania, probably gives us the best overall account of what scouts or spies would have looked like. He wrote that, quote, on the frontiers, and particularly amongst those who were much in the habit of hunting and going on scouts and campaigns, the dress of the men was partly Indian and partly that of civilized nations. Doddridge mentions that they would wear uh, almost universally a hunting shirt open before, drawers, I'm wearing buckskin breeches, right, or breeches and leggings. And I have my leggings here in my hand. These are blue wool leggings and I'm not wearing them today because I'm not out in the woods and it's July and they're very hot uh, as you start moving around. But wool leggings to protect your legs and almost exclusively moccasins or what was called Indian shoes at times and Doddridge talks about the moccasins being gathered at the toe and sewn with a single seam along the top. Now I'm also not wearing my moccasins right now because it rained pretty hard here last night and everything is really wet. When you put these on and it's that wet then they just tend to soak up the water immediately and it's like walking around in wet socks. So right now I'm barefoot but if I had to head out in the woods I'd be putting all this stuff on as a protective measure for my legs and my feet. Now some people will ask about a breech clout. What about a breech clout? leggings. When were those worn? Well, Doddridge actually does discuss that those were worn later in the Indian Wars and predominantly by younger people. Now, there are a couple of things here I want to talk about a little bit more in depth. I'm going to start with this knife right here. This is the British trade style knife. Oftentimes they were called scalpers and many frontiersmen were known to have carried these longer belt style knives. Now smaller pocket knives were also pretty common and may even be used in lieu of one of these. I actually carry one of each but this is the knife that I carry on my belt. Keep it super sharp and it's, uh, it's used for all kinds of different things. Skinning game and of course it could be a fighting knife if, uh, if you found yourself in that situation. Next is the tomahawk, right? These small tomahawks. Now you see them sometimes called hatchets. 
uh, but for the most part, these are, are almost exclusively fighting implements. This is designed for hand-to-hand -hand or close combat. You see some accounts of tomahawks being thrown, and we're actually going to look at that in future videos a little bit more to see what that, uh, what that throwing would have done and how that may have been an effective fighting tactic. Now these, again, small, light, fast, very sharp. They could be used for other small tools or other, as a small tool itself in other instances, but for the most part, this is a fighting weapon, oftentimes worn in the belt, according to Doddridge, worn on the right side. Now I want to talk about the firearm just a second. This is a 54 caliber flintlock rifle, meaning there are lands and grooves cut into the bore that spiral all the way down to the chamber. And it's a single shot muzzle loading weapon, fires most accurately with a patched round ball, but it could be fired with an undersized or unpatched round ball in a pinch as well. Um, a very accurate weapon for, for me as a user, out to about 100 yards or so. I'm still working on getting better with it out to there, but uh, a very, very accurate weapon, um, though it's a little bit slow to load. Now it also doesn't uh, come with the ability to attach a bayonet to the end. So going back to the use of this tomahawk here, oftentimes this is used in lieu of what other military style weapons like muskets and bayonets uh, might be more useful for in a hand-to-hand -hand combat scenario. But remember, these scouts and spies, they weren't necessarily out for a fight. They were out observing, they were out tracking, they were out surveilling, they were out to, to gain information to report back. Not necessarily, and, and usually not at all, as a viable fighting force. Now my powder horn is just a pretty simple cow horn. It's got a pine plug in the back. It's got a very simple hand wrought iron nail to hold the, uh, the strap on the back. And it's got a small, simply carved wooden peg to hold the contents inside. There's no carving or anything on this horn. It's very simple. And it has a plain undyed linen strap to hold it to my body. And I think these are probably some of the more common actual weapons and implements that, that you would have seen in the hands of the more common plain scout or spy on the American frontier. So my shooting pouch itself is really pretty simple. It's a brain tan buckskin pouch, not very large. In it, I carry a whetstone for sharpening the knife and the tomahawk. I carry some extra patching material. I carry some extra round balls. I carry some extra flints for the gun itself. I have a stuck patch remover and a stuck ball remover. And I have an antler powder measure based off of an original. And a vent pick, double-sided vent pick, also based off an original. Now food's an interesting topic because the food has to be shelf stable and you have to be able to carry it over a period of several days. Um, and you may have to eat it without the benefit of cooking it over a fire. So thankfully we have a little bit of information from Samuel Brady's scouts and they carried wheat bread. And they carried sometimes some flour for, for making ash cakes um, and then bacon. Now we talk about bacon for just a second. This is a dry cured bacon so it doesn't actually require refrigeration and, uh, and more importantly you could eat this raw and I say that because there are times as scouts and spies when you may not be able to make a fire so the rations that you carry needed to be something that you could eat raw. In the 21st century this sounds ridiculous right? No one's gonna sit in the woods under a tree eating a raw strip of Hormel bacon but we need to think in, in 18th century terms and the term bacon itself doesn't necessarily mean then what it meant what it means to us today and so think more charcuterie and less prepackaged big box grocery store bacon now for some of the personal comfort items that I carry with me obviously a blanket's going to be a big choice now in the fall and winter, oftentimes I'll carry two woolen blankets. This is a, a thinner trade style blanket. It's based off of an original in the Von Reck Image series. And uh, it, it's, it's a great blanket. It's a little bit thin for colder weather. So oftentimes put a much larger uh, and thicker blanket in with this and carry two blankets. That thicker blanket can be used as a shelter in a pinch, uh, or it can be used draped around you and help turn some of the rain. And of course, wool being used as rain 
cover is not unknown uh, to mankind. It's been used throughout the centuries. Anyone who comes from a shepherd culture who has ever studied a, a sheep herding culture knows that some of the shepherds, even in biblical times, would wear heavy woolen cloaks uh, to turn both the wind and the rain. Now to hold all of my personal effects, I have a very simple linen style knapsack. It has a single flap across the top with three buttons, two straps for your shoulders, and a simple sternum strap tie to help kind of keep it all together. If you're interested in putting a scout or spy impression together, a knapsack's a really good choice for holding your personal effects, and it's documented. Well, what's also documented are market wallets. Market wallets being these long strips of linen with a small slit in the middle to hold items on each side. Think of them like the uh, grocery store plastic bag of the 18th century. Now the contents of my knapsack are also pretty simple. Carry a spare pair of moccasins, at least one, if not two. I carry, as Doddridge suggested also, a, a moccasin repair kit. And in it, it has leather for patching the moccasins. It has additional uh, brain tan wangs or brain tan strings, if you will, designed to help uh, stitch the moccasin together or tie the moccasin to your feet. I have a small trade all or trade style all here, a lightning style all with an antler handle, exactly as Doddridge describes. And a pair of scissors all wrapped up in a very simple plain uh, linen scrap of cloth. I have my fire kit here as well. This fire kit is based on an original called the Jayquith pouch. I believe it's uh, an original in Connecticut or somewhere in New England. And the original has some tow in it. This is just a byproduct of the linen making material. It's an excellent uh, material for, to use as tinder for fire starting. It has a fire steel that's tethered to the bag itself. Um, it actually has a fire rope in it as well. These are just s simple small ropes made of hemp or made of linen tow that you can use to catch a spark with your flint and steel. And then it's got some extra pieces of chert or flint in it for the fire making process. And all that is in this envelope style pouch, which I believe it's around five by seven if the original uh, dimensions are striking me correctly. And again, it's just a great little envelope style pouch to hold all of your uh, fire making material. I carry a cow's knee. Now this, this is a colloquial term for this piece of leather that goes over the lock of the firearm itself. It's made of oiled leather and these straps are used to tie around the gun. And that's designed to keep the water and moisture out of the pan, which would obviously inhibit the firing of the rifle. I carry an extra pair of wool socks and I carry a bison wool hat. Yep, yeah, that's right. This hat is made of the hair of the American bison. It's knit by Emily Burns, one of my favorite hats, extremely warm. And uh, did you know that there was at one time a market in the 18th century uh, to use bison wool uh, in, in lieu of domestic sheep's wool? The last item I carry here, folks, is a housewife, also just known as a sewing kit. It's got some needle and thread and some extra patching material in it because remember, these are the days before machine stitching and hand stitching, as good as it can be, just doesn't seem to last as long. So one thing that I've noticed about 18th century life is if you're not manufacturing something, you're almost in a constant state of patching or repair, whether it's metalwork, um, clothing, uh, farm equipment, hunting equipment, there's almost always maintenance and upkeep to be done. Scouts and spies were the eyes and the ears of a very vast frontier defense. Light and fast, these expert woodsmen were the guardians at the very edges of early American developed society. We'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.